risen. He is risen indeed. Hey, Grace Point, welcome. Happy Easter. He is risen. He's risen indeed. And to any visitors who found us online, we want to welcome you to the neighborhood. Today's service is one for the whole family. Hey kids, make sure you pay close attention to special code words during Rick's message. And now, I want to welcome Pastor Chris and a very special correspondent. Hey Dad, are you painting a face on an egg? Yes, I am. Have you lost your mind? No. It's for Easter. Ah, uh, Easter! Okay, what's wrong with Easter now? Uh, I just don't understand it. Why do you give me chocolate? What do you mean? When I ask you for chocolate, you usually say, no, it's not good for you. But sometimes you give me more chocolate than I can eat. Like when? Easter, Halloween, Christmas. Oh. I don't get the characters either. What? What characters? The Easter characters. Which ones? Like, are the Easter Bunny and Jesus like best pals? Um, no. Is the Easter Bunny in the Bible? Does he bring eggs in a basket? Does Jesus eat chocolate? Well, the thing is, the Easter Bunny is not actually in the Bible. What do you think Jesus' favorite chocolate is? Uh... I, I, I don't know that he had a favorite. My favorite's the Eggies. Listen, son. People do lots of strange things around the holidays that don't always make a lot of sense. But the most important thing about Easter is that we remember to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Oh. You know what I really don't get? What's that? Bunnies don't even lay eggs. What do you think Easter is all about? Mm. God. Mm -hmm. Easter. Mm -hmm. Mm. Bible. It's about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Easter is about getting chocolate eggs and being. being being with your family and, and to go to beaches sometimes and uh, the time where Jesus died on the cross and we have Easter egg hunts like Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we could be together Easter and Easter egg hunts Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Can you tell me a little bit more? What else happens around Easter? Um, Jesus dies on the cross and then he goes into a tomb and he stays there for three days and then he's alive again. Who's Jesus? Jesus, the guy who sent his son down and died on the cross. Uh, that's a hard one. Okay, I, I, he, Jesus is a person. From the Bible. He died on the cross. He was put in a tomb. Then he came back. He came back. Um, he's God's son. What do you think they sent him to the cross? Um, to die for our sins. Because he saw he wasn't the son of God. Son of God, and he was, and thought he wasn't. Because, because he wanted all the sins to be gone. Because he wasn't safe. He wasn't safe, you're right, he wasn't safe. Yeah. How old is Jesus? Jesus is 2,000 years old. That's a hard one. A, a, a zillion years old? Probably not super old. Um, 1609. 100. 
100, 100, 100. 30, I mean pounds. 30 pounds. No, <laughs> pounds, just pounds. Next question. What is your favorite part of Easter? Um, um, my favorite part of Easter is eating Easter eggs. Because they have chocolates in them. Easter egg hunting and eating and finding our Easter baskets and eating chocolate and candy and Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Um, that we get to celebrate Jesus. Easter that we could be together as a family and Easter egg hunt and the food and turkey. Yeah. Uh, what are you thankful for this Easter? I'm thankful about God and Jesus and pretty much. But I can't tell you the whole thing because it will probably be super long. I'm thankful I get to spend time with my family. Uh, I'm thankful for Jesus dying on the cross, Easter hunts, my parents who set the Easter hunts up, and I'm thankful for Easter. That no one in my family has had COVID. Getting to see my family. Yeah. That we could be together as a family and food. And their friends. Yeah. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter! <laughs> oh man, happy Easter indeed. Church family, it is so good to be together on this Sunday of Sundays where we set aside this special time to recognize that Jesus not only rose from the dead, but that he defeated all of the powers of darkness and of hell. And this is the day in which we celebrate his victory like none other. And so won't you join us as we declare that this is indeed a happy day. It is the very best day and it has the very best news of all.
During the last month or so in Kids Unlimited Sunday services, our KU friends have been getting the memory verses of the week as well as clues to reveal a final secret word. So let's see what's happening today in Words to Treasure. Hey kids, sometimes, where's the treasure? We gotta do on a bit of a treasure hunt to get them. So here we are, we're going through swamps, we're going through woods, and we had hit the bridge over the river Doom to cross to get to what we're trying to get to so we can get a treasure. Let's see what we get. Ooh. This old bridge, is gonna pull my weight up. This is risky. Look at this. What kind of bird lays eggs like this? Oh, and what's this? A little note. Put these in my little treasure bag here. All right, boys and girls, in some of the previous weeks, we've had treasure and clues come to us. This week, we had to search it out. We battled the elements. We made our way through swamps, across dangerous bridges. Let's see what we've got now. So, little clue here says, 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 3. And that's what Easter is really all about. Jesus died, he rose again, he sent it to heaven, and we can have hope that we can spend eternity through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. We got two more things. Let's see what we got. These are not your average eggs. These are a little different. It's got the number four on it. Let's see what's inside. Ah, we got a letter again. That's handy. The letter R in the four egg. What else do we have? 12. Another interesting colored egg. The letter E. All right. So we have a few things to put together here. For those of you keeping score at home, we got H-E-B-W-S. Now, we've got an E and an R and 412. Bunch of letters, 412. You're smart, I bet you figure this out. And if you're stumped, we'll help you out next week. Until then. I'm not sure why we can't have that like every week. That was fantastic. And I, I think I, maybe, I know, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, church family, let's just continue in, uh, 
in this time of musical worship where we have the opportunity to declare that our Lord and Savior Jesus, not only is his name the most beautiful name, the most wonderful name, but it's also the name that is full of power, of life-giving, life-changing, world-altering power. And we just want to worship our King of Kings and Lord of Lords through song and just declare, Lord Jesus, you are the only one who is worthy of all of our praise. You were the word at the beginning, one with God. Chill 
Your name is powerful. We thank you, God, for your resurrection power that's living in us, that you went to the cross and you died and you didn't stay in the grave, but you rose again. And in that sacrifice and in that rising again, Lord, you've brought us to life. Thank you, God, for your great work that we think about, especially on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Greg and team. It's great to sing a victory song like that, a song of hope, a song of Jesus overcoming death and the sting of death being defeated by what he did for us that very first Easter. So we want to talk today about Easter hope. And no kids, it's not Easter hop, although we could talk about Easter hop. Like, what is the favorite restaurant that the Easter Bunny likes to go to? That would be IHOP. What about the Easter Bunny's favorite music? That would be hip hop. And kids, what do you get if you pour hot water down the Easter Bunny hole? Although you don't want to do that, you get hot cross bunny. So get your uh, bingo cards out there that Pastor Steve uh, told you about at the beginning. And hey, I said the word hop there, so I can uh, put my dabber there. And uh, I've got one of these because my wife, Sheila, plays bingo on Saturday nights with her mom in Saskatchewan, <laughs> you know, via FaceTime. Uh, so fill in that card, and if you get all those spots, uh, let me know. Send me an email, rick at gracepoint.ca, and I'll get a prize out to you. So if we haven't met yet, my name is uh, Rick, and happy Easter to you. And we want to talk this morning about hope. Now, when we use the word hope in our culture, we often use it synonymously with words like wish. You know, we talk about, well, I hope something works out. You know, similar to what we might think of, you know, blowing out candles and making a wish. And we all hope in something. But the things in our world, their hopefulness tends to disappoint us. Right? Because every circumstance, every relationship, every bright future will eventually wear out, fade, or go away. We can either hope in something or we can hope in someone. And for the biblical writers, they used the word hope far differently because their hope was in someone with a capital S. They knew their hope was more than just wishful thinking because it was based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we want to talk today, Easter Sunday, about how that gets lived out. And I was thinking in particular of one disciple this week, Peter, and how the resurrection impacted him. And so I want us to have a listen to the first Easter account and so my wife, Sheila, and my daughter, Kelsey, are going to read from Luke 24. You don't have to turn there in your Bible. I want you to just listen and imagine yourself in the scene there that very first Easter Sunday morning. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here, he is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered what he had, that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings, and then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Hmm. 
So we've got the women there that first Sunday morning as they come to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. They have no expectations that the tomb will be empty. So you can just imagine their emotions as they're trudging with heavy feet towards that tomb. Just think about all that they have witnessed in the previous couple days. The flogging of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. They're just absolutely devastated. So imagine their shock when they come to the tomb and the stone has been rolled away. Why? Who did this? Rome had placed a seal around that tomb. Sixteen guards were stationed there who had to literally guard that tomb with their life. What's going on here? The women go running in. There's no body. What a shock. What's going on here? And then they encounter the angels who tell them the wonderful news and ask them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And then they run back to tell the other disciples. It's the only time in the New Testament, other than the parable of the prodigal son, where the father is running, but it's the only time we see a person in the New Testament running. (laughs) They run when there's good news. The good news that Jesus is alive. And so a couple of the disciples, they have to see it for themselves. Peter and John, they run to the tomb. And the Dr. Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, mentions how the strips of linen are lying by themselves. In John's Gospel, he mentions how they're neatly folded. Now, I don't know what's involved with folding, you know, the linens of of someone who's been in the grave. All I know is trying to fold my fitted bed sheets is a difficult thing to do. And one of the theories is that Oh, Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead. That, you know, some robbers came in and stole his body. Well, if that were true, why would they neatly fold the linens as they're doing that? It doesn't really make sense, does it? So Luke writes that Peter goes away pondering, wondering. Kind of like Pastor Greg the other day when he was looking at the lilies. I said, what are you doing? He said, I consider the lilies. You know, kind of a worship pastor kind of a joke, right? The apostle Peter, he's considering, not the lilies, but he's considering what he sees. The carefully folded linens. The missing body of Jesus. The biblical writers, what I love about them is they tell it like it is, right? They're not fabricating some story. They're not trying to fit their writing into some preconceived uh, idea or some cleverly invented account. They tell it like it unfolds. Peter's confused. He's conjecturing what has just happened. He's a common sense, hardworking kind of a guy. Now he's come to the tomb and the body is not there. And then he encounters this alive Jesus And it changes Peter. More than anything else, more than the life of Jesus, more than the teachings of Jesus, even more than the crucifixion of Jesus, this alive Jesus absolutely revolutionizes his life. And we see it in the book of Acts. Because Peter, in every sermon he delivers in the book of Acts, he has only one theme. (laughs) One theme only. And that's the resurrection of Jesus. That's what he focuses upon. And this was a game changer for Peter, and I believe it's the same for us also. See, Peter, according to tradition, was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in a manner the same as his Lord and Savior, Jesus. Imagine his pain. Imagine what he went through. A man doesn't get crucified upside down for something that he knows to be a lie, something that he knows to be false. It has to be true to endure that, and it has to change his life. So how does the resurrection work, in a sense, for you and I now in 2021? Well, I want us to 
Listen to another section of Scripture, and you can turn there to this one. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. As Stephanie's going to read for us, there are six verses from 1 Peter chapter 1. And here, Peter is writing 39 years later, after Luke 24, what we heard. So what kind of wisdom has he cultivated in those four decades? Let's have a listen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept for you in heaven, though through faith, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which may perish even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end results of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Wow, I love that section of scripture. There's a lot of hope packed in there. And I see kind of four benefits that Peter lays out for us, at least four, in that section of Scripture. So let's take a look at them. Easter hope benefits for you. And the first one is that your hope is living. That we can be people of hope with this expectation of a better tomorrow because of the resurrection of Jesus. And hope is what gets us through the difficult days. Hope is what we hang on to when life is going difficult for us. We live as a person of hope because of the Easter hope. That discouragement, despondency, despair are not our default emotions, but rather it's hope because Jesus is alive. He says, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. And that term, new birth, refers to a decisive change of status and prospect, wholly due to the finished work of Christ for us, a work successfully completed in Christ's resurrection. This is our guarantee that we can have as people of hope. That Peter describes it here as living hope. The word they're living means dynamic. Uh, some of your translations say it's a lively hope. That's the hope that we can have. And Peter knew this because he experienced it for himself. No one felt the death, the agonizing death of Jesus more than Peter. He had boasted that he would never leave or forsake Jesus, but he failed miserably. When the moment came, a girl at a charcoal fire questioned his association with Jesus and he caved in. He denied that he knew Jesus. And you can imagine the shame and the grief that this brought him. In fact, in Mark's gospel, we read there some final words about how in the darkness of the night, Peter is weeping bitterly. But here, four decades later, he speaks of a living hope that gives us a new status. I'm sure some of you watching here today, you perhaps can identify with Peter. Maybe your hopes have been crushed. Maybe you had certain expectations of where you would be at or how things would be working out. And last year, 2020, worst year ever, and then you thought with 2021 and still. Or maybe you had a certain ethical standard that you wanted to live up to and you have failed miserably. Maybe it's a dream that didn't pan out for you. Whatever it may be, I want to remind you that God is not done with you. You can have this living hope because today, Easter Sunday, you're reminded that Jesus is alive. 
Second aspect of hope that he tells us. He's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That this list of benefits that Peter's writing about here, some of the benefits are here and now benefits that we can enjoy on this earth, and others of them are benefits for the life after. And here this inheritance is kind of a both-and benefit. That when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we're adopted into God's family, we become sons and daughters of the King. And we enjoy the inheritance he gives us. And that word inheritance that's used here means the full realized possession of an inheritance, not just the title to it. It was used in the Old Testament for when the Israelites went into Canaan and they claimed the land that was there. What we have today in Jesus Christ can't perish, spoil, or fade. The Westminster Catechism asked the question, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is your inheritance, friends, to enjoy God. Our inheritance is not something here on this earth that it's tied to anything like real estate values or the rate of inflation or the stock market or anything else like that. You say, Rick, my inheritance? Well, show me the money. <laughs> but see, the inheritance isn't about money. We tend to think of that here in earthly terms, but it's something far greater than that. Your inheritance is Jesus Christ himself. That's what he offers to you. And as Peter writes here to people who have never met Jesus, and he says to them, you heard in the scripture reading there, that though you haven't seen him, you love him. That's the same thing can be true for you and I. That with our physical eyes, we haven't seen Jesus, but we can still love him. It was great to uh, see some of you this week at the uh, Palm Sunday um, drive through where you picked up your Holy Week uh, package, including this devotional. And there's one last day of devotions today, Easter Sunday. And I would encourage you to do it. Kids, I give you permission in there to run around the house and scream. You know, you can do it. I've written it in there. But one thing I want you to do that I mentioned there is to get alone and to hear God call you by name. Just alone, on your knees, or sitting somewhere, and in silence, to hear the still, small voice of Jesus. Now, when I say call your name, I don't mean like when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Like, you're thinking, I don't want to die yet. He's going to call my name. No, no. But like Mary that we read there in Luke 24. And she says in John's gospel, I have seen the Lord, that you and I would say that same. That today, Easter Sunday, we have seen the Lord. We have encountered this alive Jesus. We can be people of hope because Jesus is alive. And we can live in relationship with him. And someday, someday the full realization of that inheritance that's talked about in verse 4 will be realized when you and I see him face to face. That brings us to the next benefit that he mentions there. And to an inheritance, verse 4, that can never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This is obviously a benefit for the afterlife that we all live here on this earth with a certain amount of fear. And this last year, that's certainly been elevated, right? Because of COVID. And we've been reminded about a virus that can kill us. But what does Easter give us? Hope. Hope beyond even death itself. As John writes in Revelation 21, that someday God will wipe every tear away from their eyes, that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Why is that? Because in heaven, death has been defeated, and there will be no more sin 
or crime, nor more, more betrayal or bickering, no more job losses or bankruptcy, no more anxiety or worry, no more broken relationships or abuse, no more lockdowns or COVID. Can I get an amen on that? No more bullying or fighting, no more sickness or hospital treatments or death. Friends, aren't you looking forward to your forever home in heaven? A future benefit that the resurrection of Jesus guarantees. A final benefit that Peter lists there in verse 6 and verse 8, it's a here and now benefit. He says in verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice. Verse 8, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. That the Bible says that in face of all the difficulties, all the adversity that you and I may encounter face in life, that we can have something deep within us, and that is joy, greater than a circumstantial happiness that old Peter, writing four decades after he's been to the empty tomb and he's gone through all sorts of adversity in his own life, can talk about this joy. That Peter's readers haven't seen Jesus, but they can still experience the joy that comes from the resurrection Christ. And you and I, living in fellowship with God, can also experience that. And this affects our attitude towards our trials and troubles. Verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials that for a little while, we're going to suffer. Well, how long is a little while? Well, I don't know. Some of the translations say, for a season. Well, how long does a season last? Well, for the Canucks, you know, playoffs, it's just a really short season, right? For winter, that could be a really long season if it felt like this year. But the good news is, friends, God has his eyes on the clock. He's watching your life. And though that season of pain may be a month, a year, a decade, decades, he's watching the clock and he cares for you and he can fill you with his joy. A life eternal, a life full of joy. And friends, though you may be going through hard times now, hang on to hope because God is at work in your life. And you can have joy because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, even in spite of any adversity or your present state of circumstances. So let me ask you a question. How does the resurrection of Jesus make a difference in your life? Like, let's imagine two scenarios. Number one, Jesus we're not alive today. Jesus never busted out of that tomb. Or scenario number two, that there was no COVID, no restrictions. Everything was kind of back to normal. Let me ask you, which one would make a bigger difference in your life? Jesus dead or no COVID? What difference does the resurrection make for you? See, Peter gives us all these benefits that we can experience because Jesus is alive. And so I say, friends, look at the empty tomb. See it for yourself. God is for you. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus here to this earth for you. And Jesus came and he died and he rose again. But you have to encounter him for yourself. I can't do that for you. No one else can do that for you. <laughs> I'm just like a tour guide. I could just take you here to the story. But then you have to walk, in a sense, into the empty tomb yourself. You have to pray yourself. <laughs> you have to believe in your heart yourself. You have to exercise faith yourself. But you can do that because of him. And so I say today, consider, not consider the lilies, but consider the empty tomb. Ponder it and the difference that it makes for you and what hope looks like in your life. 
And I've been praying all week for you that Jesus' hope would just manifest itself in your life. And if you need someone to pray with you, to encourage you, there's a number on the screen right now. I would just encourage you to text the word hope, H-O-P-E. Just text that word hope to that number. And one of us is a Grace Point staff will reach back to you. And don't worry, you won't be put on any list or anything like that. And it may be just a text exchange, maybe a prayer via text. It may be a Bible verse. Um, in some way, if we can help you to experience this hope. For me, as I look back on my life, my difficulties, my challenges, my broken dreams, my wishes that weren't fulfilled, I never always saw God there at that very instant. But I look back and I can see his faithfulness in my life. And you can too, as you look at your life. And you can be that person of hope because of Jesus' resurrection. The author Bruce Larson once visited the famous Menninger Clinic in the United States, one of the top five psychiatric hospitals in America. And he asked the staff there, he said, what makes the biggest difference in the treatment of the patients here at the Menninger Clinic? And the doctor said, the biggest difference is hope. When a person has hope, they tend to turn the corner on their life. And friends, what better place to find hope than today, Easter Sunday, in this person, Jesus Christ, who loves you and offers to fill you with his hope that you can live in the inheritance that he has given to you, a living hope that you can walk in day after day and you can experience his joy because he loves you. Let me pray for you. Oh, Jesus, I just pray for each person watching now. You know every circumstance, every relationship, every struggle, every challenge. And yet you are the God of hope. And you promise in your word that you as the God of hope will fill us with all peace and joy as we trust in you. And so I'm asking that every person viewing here, that you would help them to take that step of trust, take that step forward towards you, Jesus, towards your love, towards your hope. Thank you that you are for us. Thank you what you have done for us. Thank you that we too can exclaim, we have seen the Lord. And he's done so much for me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Rick, for that encouraging message this Easter morning. And uh, yeah, let's finish off our time this morning and uh, lift up and praise and glorify the one who has conquered the grave, our Lord and our Savior. Let's sing together. Darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger.
Oh, church family, for 2,000 years, the church has proclaimed, he has risen. Through every pandemic and war, famine, you name the conditions, he has risen, he has risen indeed. Live with that Easter hope, amen.